Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name's Ryan McCauley. I'm with Caltrain. Thank you for joining us where we're going to talk today about the Caltrain business plan and choosing our long range vision. Uh, just to set a couple ground rules, we will be monitoring the chat with our whole team here. So if you have questions, any sort of clarifying comments, go ahead and put those in the chat and we can answer them as fast as we can. If you're looking for some more information, uh, we have a lot of details on our website, caltrain2040.org. You can look up old presentations, fact sheets. We have individual jurisdiction booklets if you're interested in those as well. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce project manager Sebastian Petty, who can go into the plan. Hi, everyone. Thanks for participating today. My name is Sebastian Petty. I'm the director of policy development at Caltrain and the manager for the Caltrain business plan. Uh, this is an important uh, sort of interim point in the business plan process. The business plan is really a long-range comprehensive plan for Caltrain that looks at the future of the service and the corridor. Uh, and we're approaching a, a real important decision point where we'll be asking our board to provide input on what the long-range vision for the Caltrain service should be. So the presentation I'll run through today uh, talks about different options that we've studied in the process and weighs some of the different costs and benefits uh, and outcomes of those options, uh, and then presents a staff recommendation regarding what staff thinks is the best path forward for Caltrain. At the end of the presentation, we'll also talk through um, a variety of, of materials about the Caltrain organization. So as we're thinking about how the Caltrain uh, service could grow and evolve over time, we're also thinking about how the organization may need to grow and change. Uh, so today, I'll, I'll, the first uh, part of the presentation will be focused on a discussion of a long-range vision for Caltrain service. We'll talk a little bit about why we need to have a vision and what the board might really be asked to decide in a few months. Uh, we'll talk about the process of developing scenarios and the work we did to do that, to, to think about the different options for the service. We'll, we'll talk about the different ways that we weigh the choice of which vision we should choose, um, different metrics to evaluate our options and to think about different factors. And finally, I'll present the staff recommendation. I'll talk a little bit about what comes next. And then finally, I'll close by talking about the organizational assessment work we've done and uh, the, the focus we're bringing to the Caltrain organization. So why does Caltrain need a vision? At the start of this presentation, it's important to take a, a, a few big steps back and, and think about why we're even asking this question at all. Why are we uh, curious about the future of Caltrain? Why does Caltrain matter? Um, the, the first reason is that Caltrain is really part of a, di of a dynamic corridor. Uh, the, the Caltrain corridor has existed for over 150 years. We've had passenger rail trains operating between San Francisco and San Jose. And during that time, uh, the cities and communities we run through have changed tremendously. We've gone from a, a population in San Mateo County, for example, from 20,000 people in 1900 to over 700,000 people in 2010 to a projection of nearly a million people in 2040. And, and this is a, a level of growth and dynamism that we see all up and down the corridor. And that corridor is made up of many very different communities. Caltrain connects uh, very urban places like downtown San Francisco or downtown San Jose with smaller towns, um, sort of mid-range cities. We connect a lot of different places, and, and each of those communities is changing in different ways. All of those communities are growing in the context of a, of a region that's really starting to experience some challenges. Um, and, and these are challenges that have been in the headlines um, and that really any resident of the Bay Area is struggling with. Things like housing prices that are, that are rising and increasingly out of the reach of many residents, uh, commute times that seem to be getting longer and longer. Um, we're also existing in a region that, that is starting to have to think about climate change and the, the kinds of impacts that may bring, whether it's uh, increased incidence of forest fires, um, sea level rise, so we're, we're, we're looking at a horizon that isn't all smooth sailing. There's some real challenges ahead. And, and when we think about how Caltrain fits into all of that and, and the kinds of long range decisions we need to make, uh, those are some of the factors that in, inform the context around us. The issue of urban growth and the challenges of growth are, are not a phenomenon that are unique to the Bay Area. Um, 
urbanization is a global phenomenon around the world. Cities are, are growing and, and more of the world's population lives in cities uh, than lives outside of them now. And when we look around the world, um, railroads have been a major tool to help manage and shape that change. Um, railroads are an old technology, they're not a new technology, um, but they're one that continues to garner a lot of investment around the world. Uh, the rail industry is a very mature industry around the world and there's uh, trillions of dollars that have gone into it um, to help uh, ensure that urban growth is happening in a way that's sustainable and helps people uh, get to where they're wanting to go. In the Bay Area, the future of rail is still coming together. Um, there are many different plans and projects that are underway. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Salesforce Transit Center in San Francisco. That'll one day be the, the future terminal for Caltrain as well as high-speed rail. Um, there are major plans to redevelop the Deardon Station in San Jose. Uh, the high-speed rail system for California is one day plan to connect into the Bay Area. There are thoughts about increased capital corridor or A service, a potential rail connection across the Dumbarton Bay. So there's a lot of thinking and planning work uh, going on in the state and in the Bay Area around rail, but, but there isn't necessarily a single cohesive vision that's come together yet. Caltrain is, is doing uh, a lot of work uh, to, to think about what its future is, and, and that future is, is coming up on us fast. As some of you may know, we're in the process of electrifying the railroad, so we're putting up an overhead catenary system and buying new electrified trains. Those trains will roll into passenger service in 2022. And so for Caltrain, that means we, we are going to be um, kind of at the, the forefront of modern rail in California. We'll be the, the first system with shiny new trains rolling down the tracks. And, and that puts us in a place where we really have an ability and a responsibility to sort of think about what the, the vision for rail in our corridor is and how that uh, supports a regional vision coming together. Um, and it's, it puts us in a place of a, sort of a unique opportunity, and that's the context that we're having this conversation in. And, and really, at the end of the day, the reason that we're, we're talking about all of this and, and thinking about whether it makes sense to invest public money is, is to look at whether it makes life easier uh, for the people who live up and down the corridor, who ride our trains and, and work in our communities. Um, at the end of the day, transportation is a means to an end, and um, the measure of our success is, is if people use our service and it makes their lives more livable. So within that context, uh, what is a long-range service vision? When we talk about a long-range service vision, what we're really talking about is, is kind of an achievable end state for Caltrain, uh, for what the corridor could look like in 2040. And so that means having an understanding of how many trains might be running in the corridor, what their frequencies and stopping patterns could be. It means understanding the general types of infrastructure that would be required to support that service. So uh, the number of trains we would need, the kinds of uh, track infrastructure or systems. It also means having an understanding of the costs of, of providing that service and, and of the outcomes, the, the ridership, the mobility benefits different ways we would measure um, the productivity of that service. But the, the key thing to understand is when we talk about a long-range vision, we're really talking about the complete picture of what a system could one day become. We're doing this visioning process in the context of our business plan because it's really an important step to be able to put together a really well thought out uh, business plan that can be uh, built incrementally over time. The long-range vision sets a target for us that we can then work towards incrementally. Um, so for the long-range vision to be successful, uh, there are a few things it needs to accomplish. It needs to be rooted in, in really thorough, credible analysis. Um, it needs to not be pulled out of thin air. It needs to really respect and integrate and work with all of the existing policy commitments and, and projects and plans that are ongoing in the region. Um, it needs to have enough detail that it, that it can actually be useful to us, that it can provide guidance and, and kind of help us make decisions along the way. But at the same time, it needs to be sufficiently general and, and flexible that as, as plans change or, or projects change or are delayed or accelerated, uh, we have the ability to, to adapt and respond and, and do, that, do so within a vision that still will remain relevant. 
So just to orient everyone to where we are in the process, um, really we've been working for the last year to develop different scenarios um, and, and evaluate those scenarios. So looking at different options for how the railroad could grow. This has been a, a pretty intensive planning process and it's been going for nearly a year now. Coming up in, in August, uh, we'll be going to our board to lay out a staff recommendation for the long range uh, service vision uh, for their consideration. And then over the next couple of months, we'll, we'll take that recommendation out uh, to the community and to our stakeholders and partner agencies for their review and input. Uh, if that goes well, uh, we'll refine the vision and come back to the board in October for potential adoption. Following the board's adoption, uh, we'll then do a series of work to really focus in a little bit more on the near term and uh, develop a full business plan uh, that shows how we could pay for the vision and how we could implement it over time. And that's what we'll take to our board in early 2020 to complete the business plan. So as we start to put together the vision, one of the first things we need to do is really uh, baseline what that vision is. And so the, some of the questions that, that inform that are, are looking at what state, regional, and local projects have already been built or planned in the Caltrain corridor or are anticipated by 2040. Um, we also want to look at the kind of service that Caltrain has previously planned for, that our partners have planned for and really look at how uh, we can start collecting all of these different projects and concepts and, and start to fit them together and, and understand what they cost. Um, one of the sort of opportunities and challenges of doing this kind of planning work in the Caltrain corridor is it's not just all about Caltrain. Um, as we look to the long range future, we really have to think not just about the future of the Caltrain service, but how that service interacts with and integrates a whole range of, of regional plans and projects. Um, so we know where we are today with the Caltrain service and we know that soon we'll be an electrified service, but there's a, a lot of uncertainty as we look out beyond that to 2040. Um, we also need to think about partner projects, um, and I mentioned a few of the big ones, the Diridon station reconstruction, uh, grade separations along the Caltrain corridor. There are a, a tremendous number of communities along our corridor that are planning for grade separation projects. High-speed rail, uh, the state's high-speed rail system is a, is a project that has a huge influence over the, the future of Caltrain, uh, since they will share our corridor. The downtown extension uh, from Caltrain's current northern terminal at 4th and King uh, to the Salesforce Transit Center is another major one that influences our service. And so when we look at that long range vision, we need to start putting all of those different pieces together um, to, to start getting a picture of what the system could look like in 2040. Once we pull it all together, we can, we can then develop a cohesive vision and then start working backwards. And so that is the arc of the plan we're on. It's to put together the big the biggest possible picture, figure out what that can look like, and then step by step work backwards to today. So what are the milestones we, we know today and how do we get to the baseline? Um, so today in 2018, 2019 now, uh, Caltrain operates a diesel fleet. In 2022, we'll begin electrified operations. Uh, looking out a little further to 2029, that's the date that High Speed Rail has said they would start operating their valley to valley service. So coming in from the Central Valley to the Bay Area, at that point they would operate two trains on our corridor. It's also uh, the date that uh, a number of other regional projects would, would come online, uh, most notably the downtown extension to San Francisco, uh, potential Dumbarton Rail connection, BART connection to San Jose and Diridon. 2033 is when High Speed Rail has said that they would have their full system up and running. So on the Caltrain corridor, that would be as many as four High Speed Rail trains per hour per direction. Um, and that's really about the limit of where planning has, has been to date in the Caltrain corridor. So really to date, our long range plan has been um, to have as many as six Caltrain trains per hour per direction running along with four High Speed Rail trains. The baseline service we've thought about is really based on what we've planned for previously as well. Um, so today Caltrain runs a maximum of five trains per peak hour per direction. Um, it's a very commute hour oriented service. Our, our off peak service or, or evening service is fairly limited. 
Um, starting in 2022, uh, with the electrification project, we'll be able to uh, electrify a majority of our fleet and, and go up to um, six trains per hour per direction. We'll also be looking to make improvements to off-peak service at that time. Um, and our service plans haven't really changed too much beyond that as we look forward uh, to 2029, 2033, and 2040. Uh, we've, we've sort of kept them at the same uh, six train per hour per direction in the commute. Um, we've looked at a skip stop, uh, sort of a regular skip stop pattern of service that, that kind of spreads that service out throughout the corridor. Um, and, and that's really been where sort of planning for the future of Caltrain service has been baselined. And so you can see that diagram on the left of the screen. Uh, those diagrams, you'll see a few of these in, in this presentation, represent one hour of one direction of service on the Caltrain corridor. Each uh, vertical line represents a train pattern. Uh, the dots within that line represent the number of times it would stop at the station designated on the left. And so in the case of the baseline, what you're seeing is four high-speed rail trains shown in blue. Um, so that, that pattern on the left repeats four times. And then you see... Um, three distinct skip stop Caltrain patterns, each with two trains per hour per direction. So what about the, the kinds of investments that are, are needed or assumed in that, that baseline scenario? Um, the, the Caltrain service in the baseline really only increases modestly beyond what we're, we're planning for already in 2022. Um, but the region is thinking about a lot of different investments uh, during that same time period. Um, so we're, we're looking at a, a baseline set of investments that includes not just the Caltrain projects that are already underway. Um, they also include, uh, again, a full range of sort of local, regional, and state partner projects, um, as well as some additional Caltrain investments that would be needed uh, to really support sort of the full realization of, of that baseline level of 2040 service. You can see those roughly mapped out on, on the right of the screen. Um, and so, so those projects include extending the line to downtown San Francisco, includes the Deardon station, it includes a, a huge number of grade separations that cities are actively planning for all up and down the corridor. Um, so there's a, there's a real range of, of different investments that are being thought about and planned um, across the Caltrain line. One of the things we've done in this project is to, to go through all of those different investments uh, that, are, that are either underway um, uh, by Caltrain or that are being thought about or planned or, or designed by our partner agencies and, and tally up the costs. And those costs are actually quite high. So right now there's about $2.3 billion of Caltrain work that's underway. The majority of that is our electrification program. Um, these are $2.3 billion that are really critical investments that will support the future of the system. When we look to what the region is planning in the corridor, um, it, it's, it's really quite a substantial amount of infrastructure. And so all the numbers here have been adjusted to $2018. Um, so for any of you who are maybe familiar with these projects and are expecting a particular number, the, the numbers have all been just, uh, adjusted to be normalized to the same year, so, so some of the numbers may be slightly different than, than what you're used to. Um, but some of the, the major regional projects that are out there include the downtown extension to Salesforce Transit Center, the Deardon Station, um, high-speed rail investments that would be needed in the corridor, as well as, a, again, a, re a very large number of city-led grade separations that are being uh, actively planned for and advanced by local communities. When we add those all up, uh, it, it comes to more than $16 billion worth of investment, so really a, a huge capital investment that's going into the region. The last piece of the baseline is uh, what we've identified as new Caltrain investments that would be required for us to really sort of fully support uh, service in that baseline scenario. So these are investments not to dramatically expand service, it's just really to make sure that by 2040 we've got a, um, a fully functional system that's compatible uh, with all of the other investments planned in the corridor. The, there are about $3.6 billion worth of these. Um, they, they range in terms of what's contemplated. Um, 
from uh, new fleet uh, in 2022, we're not fully electrifying our fleet. We're, we're partially electrifying it by 2040. We would need to fully electrify our fleet. Um, we believe that by 2040, we'll need a new maintenance facility. And so that's included in that number. Um, we think that we'll need to achieve level boarding given the sorts of uh, ridership growth that we're expecting and the shared system with high-speed rail. Um, so there's a range of those kinds of investments in there. The next couple of slides uh, just enumerate um, the overall program of investments uh, that would be required to uh, achieve the baseline level of growth, and these include the regional projects as well. Uh, we've divided them into broad categories like track and rail, systems, stations and platforms, grade crossings and, and separations, terminals and yards, and, and fleet. So again, really a, a, a huge program of investment, but projects that are being planned and are important to um, all of the communities in our corridor, to our regional partners. And so uh, at the kind of the start of this process is we're um, putting together kind of a big vision. This was an important effort for us to go through and kind of gather up and enumerate all of these different projects. When we profile those out over time, um, and again, we've just taken the date that, that generally these projects are being planned for, we can see there really is this, this big bulge of investment that's required in the, the 22 through 2033 timeframe. Most of these projects are being thought about or planned um, uh, to be under construction or delivered generally in that timeframe between the mid 2020s to the early 2030s. So again, we're, we're, we're thinking about a long range vision and, and staring down a, a really huge sum of investment. And so it's important to ask, what does it mean for Caltrain to choose a long range vision? Um, the Caltrain corridor is, is really a key transportation asset to all of the counties and cities and communities we run through. Um, and we are in a way the thread that connects a lot of these different projects that are being contemplated. Um, most of these projects aren't funded. Um, and so when I talk about $20 billion, we're, we're talking about $20 billion that at this point largely doesn't exist. Um, we've put together a baseline vision that, that incorporates all of these in different, all these different investments. Um, and so we've, we've sort of set the table. Um, and then from there, what we've done is look at how we could layer additional service on top of those investments and, and thought about what additional costs or projects uh, might enable us to do that. So really what it comes down to is that the, the core question we're, we're asking our board to consider in, in selecting a long range vision for Caltrain is, is fundamentally how much service should we provide? If we as a region or a corridor um, are planning for this level of investment in rail, uh, the question really is how can we best take advantage of that? How can we build on what we're doing and what we're planning for and, and really ultimately how many trains should be run to, to, to take advantage of those investments and support the needs of the region. So the next step in, in our business planning process was to develop different scenarios, so different options for, for what the vision could look like. And we really started uh, that process by looking at what we think the market for rail service might be in the long term. Uh, today, Caltrain serves about 60,000 daily riders. Um, uh, it's a ridership that's fairly concentrated around our express system. Um, we have a strong bi-directional market in the Caltrain corridor. So we serve uh, people going both ways. Uh, San Francisco is certainly our lar largest station, but it doesn't dominate the system. We've got a bunch of different origins and destinations. Um, so we've got a really robust market, uh, and, and it's also a market that looks like it's going to grow substantially in the future. Um, we've done a, a, a range of analysis in this plan that suggests that by 2040, Caltrain has the potential to serve over 200,000 daily riders. Uh, a lot of that is driven just by the, the land use change and, and growth that's happening in our corridor. Um, when we look at the regional projections, uh, it's estimated that we'll be adding about 1.2 million people within two miles of Caltrain, so people living or working within two miles of our station. Uh, that's happening in a context of significant freeway congestion. It's also happening, uh, as I 
talked about it at length earlier uh, in a corridor where we're expecting a lot of major transportation investments and, and connections. Uh, so the, the, ca the market for Caltrain in the future uh, looks like it could be really robust. We think that there's going to be a lot more uh, demand uh, from land uses in the corridor, and we're going to have a more connected corridor that's, that's better integrated with the, the rest of the region's transportation system. And so that leads us to believe that, that we're, we're looking at a lot of potential riders in the future. So from that initial market assessment, we then went into a, a fairly intensive service planning process. Uh, we, we started by really developing some parameters and goals for future service plans. We identified a range of different service approaches. We developed peak hour concepts on the corridor and then screened and evaluated those down. Um, extend, extended those concepts down to Gilroy and thought about how they would work at our terminals, thought about weekend and off-peak services, uh, and then also did a range of explorations to understand how flexible the concepts we came up with were, how they could integrate with other regional rail projects. Casey, would you like to do the outreach section? Hi everyone, my name is Casey Fromson. I'll cover a few of the outreach slides now. Um, so on slide 31, um, this is a snapshot of kind of the path we've taken to make sure we have a comprehensive approach to our outreach. A uh, couple of the key groups here we want <coughs> folks to know about is the local policymaker group that's made up of elected officials from all 21 jurisdictions along the corridor, their staff equivalent group, and then you can see on the list here, we have several other groups that we've been meeting with on a regular basis, everyone from the stakeholder advisory groups to the GMs of the other agencies. We know that for a project of this size and importance, it's really critical for us to have that input from many different layers in the project. Um, moving on to the next slide, you can see a little bit by the numbers there of Again, we're doing our best to make sure that this information is out there and that we're getting good feedback. This is another opportunity today, um, but this is looking back in time that over the last year we've had 50 plus public meetings where we've presented this information and we're gonna have a lot more as we move forward with the, the recommendation and getting feedback from a variety of places. On this next slide about public engagement and different kind of tools and places to, to provide your feedback, the community meetings are all listed on the Caltrain Business Plan website. Again, that's caltrain2040.org. We have all of the upcoming ones listed there, so that's a great resource. We're also going to have an online open house. That's a dynamic way to get this information. It's going to be a condensed version of this PowerPoint, a very condensed version of that. Um, so look uh, at the website listed on this slide for where you can get that information. That's going to be live on August 1st. And then we've been using a variety of other engagement tools um, everything from YouTube Town Hall, which we're doing today, to a data visualization challenge that we had and had good feedback on that. So there's many different ways um, that we're trying to keep people involved and uh, aware of our effort. Um, another unique resource that we have on the website right now is city booklets for each jurisdiction. So if you're interested in how your own particular uh, city and community would benefit and, you know, be involved in the project. We have these booklets up on the website, caltrain2040.org. Uh, we'll continue to update those as we move forward in the, in the business plan project as well. So um, they're not gonna be static, they're gonna continue to evolve. And the last slide that we have here in the outreach section is just, again, we realize how important Caltrain is and impacts all of the different 21 jurisdictions along the corridor. So we've taken a lot of time to make sure that we're talking to each of the cities and counties along the corridor, getting their perspective and feedback and making sure that we have alignment on you know, what we wanna do for our future. So this slide's capturing some of the places and how we've talked to all, all those different jurisdictions. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Sebastian to keep talking about the service vision. So the fundamental question we've, we've been looking at in, in the long range service vision is how much service should Caltrain provide? And I talked a little bit earlier about the pathway to the, the baseline service going from 2018 to 2022 to 2029 and, and on to 2040. And we've developed, we've, we've evaluated that option as our, our baseline, so to speak. Uh, and then we also, through the service planning process I described, developed two additional options, one that we've called the moderate growth and another one called the high growth. So I talked briefly about the baseline 
growth scenario previously just to, to provide a little bit more of a, an evaluation of it or, or really um, talk about it in terms of some metrics that are comparable to the other scenarios we're looking at. Trains per hour per direction, we're talking about in the, the peak, uh, six Caltrain and four high-speed rail, off-peak service levels of, of uh, three uh, Caltrain trains per hour per direction. The stopping pattern we'd be looking at would be a skip-stop stopping pattern, so there would be uh, no local trains and no express trains. Everything would be skip-stop, um, and that's a, a pattern that allows uh, to have high-speed rail move through the corridor without uh, building new overtakes. It provides um, fairly good travel times to, to most folks in the corridor. Um, the, the real challenge there is that it does result in, in bunched irregular service, um, so you wouldn't necessarily experience trains arriving at even intervals if you were standing at a station waiting to get on your train. Um, it also makes uh, certain trips very complicated um, because you have a, a skip stop pattern with different stops being skipped on different patterns so um, some trips between point A and point B could work relatively well other ones might be much more complicated you would have to transfer uh, trains in a, in a way that was awkward or um, might find some trips difficult to make at all the other thing I should mention is that the, the baseline growth scenario does not require the development of new passing tracks um, other than a four-track station at Millbrae that would be needed for high-speed rail service. Looking beyond the baseline, we developed uh, another scenario that, that adds a couple more Caltrain trains per hour per direction. This is what we call the moderate growth scenario. So in this scenario, we'd be running eight Caltrains per hour per direction and four high-speed rail trains. We'd be at six Caltrain trains during off-peak times, uh, so much more robust off-peak service. Uh, this stopping pattern is a, is a bit simpler than um, the one we showed previously. So here of those eight Caltrain trains, you really have four express trains, so similar to the baby bullet trains we have now, and then four local trains. So it's really an express and a local system. Uh, we would need some new infrastructure to allow this, this service to go forward. So in addition to the four tracks station at Millbrae, we'd need a very short overtake between Hayward Park and Hillsdale and San Mateo. We'd need a four track station in Redwood City. Um, ideally that would be the Redwood City station. It, it could also function um, in an adjacent area, but you'd want a four track station in the middle of the corridor to allow for really coordinated transfers between the express and the local Caltrain trains. We'd also need a new four-track station somewhere in northern Santa Clara County, so somewhere between Palo Alto and, and Mountain View. Uh, one of the stations, either Palo Alto, uh, California Ave, seven, San Antonio, or Mountain View uh, would need to be a four-track station. And then this plan also looks at having much better service to Blossom Hill in South San Jose, and so we would need some kind of additional infrastructure there, either uh, another four track station or potentially just some turnaround tracks uh, to enable us to provide that better service. Uh, this, this kind of service would be very evenly structured, so you would have trains arriving at even intervals on average uh, every seven and a half minutes in the corridor, um, slightly different depending where, at which station you're at, but it would be very much a, a clock face schedule, very much a uh, kind of a show up and go sort of service. Finally, we wanted to look at a service plan that really kind of pushes the, the corridor to its limits. Uh, this is the high growth scenario. And so this uh, plan kind of really is, is pretty close to the maximum of what you could accomplish on anything resembling the existing corridor. Um, and so this actually looks at running 12 Caltrain trains per hour per direction as well as four high-speed rail trains, uh, again, six Caltrain trains in the off-peak. Uh, the high growth really builds on the moderate growth, so it's, it's compatible with the moderate growth. It just kind of takes it the, the next step. Um, so we would have, again, a 15-minute local train, a 15-minute express train, and then we would actually have another 15-minute express train in this scenario. It's a lot of service. It, it gets very frequent service to a lot of stations. The, the challenge is it also requires some, some very intensive infrastructure. And so in, in this um, scenario, we'd need to build um, 
a significant passing track infrastructure that you can see shaded in blue there. So that's a, a quick overview of the, the different service scenarios we've, we've looked at. Um, and again, this is a, a, a lot of work that's been, been done very extensively over the last year. So if, if anyone watching is, is really interested in seeing the details of the service planning work, the project website, Caltrain 2040, is a great place to see past presentations and materials about those. So how do we decide? How do we weigh the decision of what Caltrain's long-range vision should be? Um, to do that, we've used an analytical approach um, that's, that's sometimes called a, a business case. And this is a sort of a decision-making framework um, that's really used by transportation agencies around the world. And it's, it's intended to sort of objectively assess or, or help weigh whether an investment makes sense and provides long-term value to the public. Um, we're, we're clearly talking about uh, projects that are very costly and have high dollar values, and so it's important to um, think about them from a number of different perspectives and really um, ask the question of, of kind of what sort of value do these projects provide and, and what are some key considerations or, or issues in choosing one over the other. So we've sort of adapted a traditional business case model to the, the specifics of the Caltrain corridor. Again, we are a very unique corridor in that we have so much shared infrastructure, so many different kind of regional projects we intersect um, that in the future will be a corridor shared with high-speed rail. So it, it makes doing this kind of analysis a little bit challenging because there's a lot of uh, extra factors that we have to consider. But we've really sort of grouped our business case analysis into, into five areas. Uh, a comparison of service, so this is a pretty straight ahead comparison of different service metrics between the scenarios. We've done a financial analysis that really looks at uh, sort of the just costs and revenues and, and kind of use it, views the, the future system in a real dollars and cents way. We've done something we call the Caltrain economic analysis, and this is a, sort of an economics benefit analysis we're calling it the Caltrain economic analysis because it's very narrowly focused on Caltrain riders. So it's really looking at what are the economic benefits or the monetized benefits to Caltrain riders of one option versus another. We've also done a regional analysis. And so this looks at benefits that extend beyond just the Caltrain rider. So thinking about um, how investing in the service one way or another really impacts the entire region or, or the broader public. And finally, uh, we've, we've focused in on, on issues related to flexibility and uncertainty. And so that's uh, kind of a little different than the other ones, but, but it's thinking about um, kind of what's the reality of choosing one of those, these visions and what does it mean in terms of the steps it allows us to take going forward. So the first section of, of the business case is really the service comparison. And we have a number of slides in this presentation that, that look at particular metrics or measures of, of how we think about service and, and compare the three scenarios against each other. And the first of those is peak period frequency. And, and what we've looked at is uh, the number of stations served by frequent service. And we've defined that as, as really a station that's getting more than four trains per hour per direction. So that's better, 15 minute service or better. Um, and there's a, there's a pretty sharp difference uh, between the scenarios here. And the baseline growth, about 13 of our stations would receive that level of service as compared to 21 in the moderate and 24 in the high. We've also looked at longest wait times that a major, uh, at a major station served by all trains. So if you're at one of the bigger stations and, and walked up to the platform, how, how long, what's the most time you'd be standing there before a train came by? And again, pretty sharp differences. In the baseline scenario that you might be waiting for still 22 minutes uh, at a station. And again, that's because trains can be fairly bunched together in that, in that service pattern. Uh, in the moderate, uh, the most you would have to wait at any station would be 12 minutes. Uh, any, any major station um, would be 12 minutes. It would be considerably less at other stations. At the high growth, it would be even less. So the most you would wait at a major station would be eight minutes. Um, so really shorten wait times and increased frequencies as you ramp up the investment in these different scenarios. We also looked at measures of, of what we call coverage and internal connectivity. Um, and so this 
is really, uh, Caldrain has a, a fairly big system. We have a lot of stations. Some of them are very big stations. Some of them are, are smaller, more neighborhood surveying. And so this measure really gets at how easy is it to get from point A to point B. If you get on one place in the system, can you get anywhere else easily? Or do you have to make a transfer? Do you have to make a transfer and maybe wait a long time for a different train to show up? Um, and again, there are some, some pretty stark differences between, between the different scenarios. The skip stop pattern in the baseline uh, really means that the internal connectivity of the system breaks down a little bit. Um, so there's a, a, a lower percentage of possible origin destination pairs that are um, connected in that scenario versus the moderate or the high growth where you have a local train that provides really comprehensive local coverage between stations. That really helps with the coverage and connectivity. And so there in those scenarios, you can see there's a very high percentage of origin and destination pairs um, that, are, that are connected. We also looked at network connectivity, and so this is really thinking about how uh, these kinds of Caltrain services work within a, a larger transit uh, ecosystem, so how local buses could connect or how we might connect with other rail systems. Um, in this case, this is a little bit more of a qualitative analysis, but, but really um, what we would find is that the, the moderate or the high growth scenarios would really work a lot better for making kind of seamless coordinated connections to other transit services. That's because the, the services are structured so that trains are arriving and departing at very evenly spaced intervals. Uh, that makes it easier to, to time our schedule to the schedules of other transit providers. Um, it makes it easier for, say, a bus to meet a train that's showing up every 15 minutes. In the baseline, again, we have an irregular service that's uh, it's skip stop and it's bunched. Uh, so it becomes much more challenging to make those kinds of trend transfers or connections. We also looked at ridership projections uh, uh, for the system, and this is material we went into a lot of detail on in, in prior presentations over the course of the year. Um, but there are some differences in terms of, of how much ridership these different service patterns would be expected to generate. Um, so we've looked out to 2040. These ridership projections are based on uh, regional land use data and transportation modeling. And uh, we also looked at constraining ridership uh, based on the space on the trains. And so we, we um, initially projected unconstrained ridership. And then in, in some cases, we actually constrained that ridership a little bit if we thought the trains were potentially going to be so crowded in the future that maybe some folks wouldn't want to take the trains. So when we compare really the, the constrained daily ridership uh, in 2040 between the different scenarios, we see that we're looking at anywhere between 150,000 riders in the baseline up to 207,000 riders in the high growth, with the, the moderate growth scenario being right around 180,000 riders. So some, some pretty significant differences there. Those differences in ridership really uh, play into some of the financial and economic analysis that you'll see later on. We also looked at travel times, uh, so the kinds of travel times that users would experience on the system. Um, generally, the, the moderate and high growth provide the, the fastest travel times for, for express services. Those are the two patterns that have a true uh, express service, sort of a baby bullet-like express service. Um, conversely, on the local trains, folks are getting somewhat slower travel times. Those, those are comprehensive uh, local services, so they're making more stops. We're doing that with new electrified rolling stocks, so they're certainly faster uh, than the local trains that you would maybe experience on Caltrain today. Um, but really, the, the moderate and high growth are kind of combining uh, sort of faster express travel times to major markets with comprehensive local coverage. The baseline kind of keeps everything going around the same speed. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag on travel time. Um, Overall, again, the major market travel times are going to be faster in the moderate and high growth. Uh, the overall average travel times that would be experienced by riders um, are on average uh, faster as well in the moderate and high growth. But these, um, you know, one of the fundamental challenges that Caltrain is addressing is that we do have a lot of stations in our corridor. And so, uh, there's only so fast we can get our overall travel times going while still actually serving those stations. 
Finally, and I, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but we, we did really take a look at sort of new four track infrastructure required. Um, I'll, I'll talk subsequently in this presentation, I've touched on it a little bit already about sort of the overall universe of, of capital investments that are required to support this service. But one that's been of uh, significant concern to, to Caltrain and really to the communities around Caltrain has been the extent to which we would need to expand the physical footprint of the corridor. Um, I think it's an important to kind of highlight uh, this issue. Caltrain is a 150-year-old rail corridor, and that means um, that we really have communities that have grown up around us. It means we don't necessarily have a lot of room around our tracks. We uh, we go right through the middle of the downtowns of, of a lot of different cities along the corridor, and that makes us a, a really great community asset, but it does mean that there are some real impacts to being on a rail corridor and some real limitations in terms of our ability to expand the infrastructure. Uh, and so when we think about growing the service, uh, one of the major challenges is, are we gonna need to add more tracks and where would we add them and, and what are some of the costs and impacts associated with doing that? And there, there are some pretty significant differences between the, the options we're looking at. So in the baseline scenario, uh, there really are no new passing tracks needed. Um, there's there's one short four track section uh, at the Millbrae station. Again, that's a that's a four track segment that would be required specifically to accommodate high speed rail's use of that station. In the moderate growth, we we have to add in uh, four additional small overtake sections: um, a, a short overtake between Hayward Park and Hillsdale. Um, a four-track station in Redwood City, a four-track station somewhere in northern Santa Clara County, and, and again, four tracks somewhere in the Blossom Hill vicinity. So overall, we're, we're talking well under five miles of, of passing track infrastructure. It's, it's fairly targeted infrastructure. Um, some of it would not be needed until such time as, as high-speed rail was on the corridor, um, but, but there is some new infrastructure needed. That contrasts pretty sharply with the high-growth scenario. Um, by the time we're up to running a, a total of 16 trains per hour per direction in the corridor, um, we're really at a point where we need to add some major four track segments. Um, and so we're in the high growth looking at anywhere between 15 and 20 miles of, of new four track segments really in, in three big chunks throughout the corridor. Um, uh, one, in the, one in the north of the corridor, north of Millbrae, one really in the middle of the corridor between San Mateo and Redwood City and then a, another major overtake um, in the Palo Alto Mountain View region. Um, so uh, a, another fairly significant differentiator in the, the kinds of infrastructure required to provide this service. The next section in the business case is the financial analysis. And uh, this financial analysis is really based on a, an investment program that's, that's structured over time and that, that builds on the baseline program that we talked about. Um, the baseline costs, uh, again, are, are roughly $22 billion um, and, and include uh, that large number associated with regional projects occurring sort of on and around the Caltrain corridor. Uh, as well as um, additional work that Caltrain is either doing now or believes we will need to do in the future. When we look at the increment of investment required to then scale that up to deliver the moderate or high growth scenarios, um, what we're looking at is uh, things like additional station enhancements, those are mode of access enhancements, platform lengthening, thing, things of that nature. Uh, we're looking at an additional investments in, in grade crossings. Um, so there are a, a huge number of grade separations assumed in the baseline. Um, additional uh, grade crossing investments and separations assumed in both the moderate and the high growth. Uh, additional fleet, uh, as we run more trains, we need to expand our fleet. Um, expansion of maintenance and storage facilities, and then the costs of the overtakes themselves. When we uh, look at that relative to the baseline, what we see is that we have a baseline of about $22.1 billion. Uh, the, high, or the moderate growth adds uh, an incremental $3.2 billion, so that gets us to $25.3 billion total. The high growth would add another $4.7 billion above that, so just hitting the $30 billion mark. 
We also uh, looked in detail at operating and maintenance costs for e all of these scenarios, and this is an area where we've, we've done some really detailed modeling in the background and, and built some tools we're really excited about as part of the business plan that'll allow us to kind of continue iterating and doing this work and looking at different investment scenarios over time. Um, but when we look at Caltrain's operating costs today, um, right now Caltrain is a contracted agency, so we're, we're managed by the San Mateo County Transit District, and there's some uh, direct costs that go straight to Caltrain, but we also contract out our service, and so there are a lot of, of the costs of operating our service uh, exist within that contract, and that's why you see the costs divided here. Today, Caltrain's current operating costs uh, run just north of $135 million a year. Um, we are an agency that has a contract operator, so some of our costs are encompassed in that contract. Others are direct to the agency. Some of the major drivers of that cost include the crew of our, of our trains, so the actual staffing of the trains, uh, maintenance of rolling stock, administration, um, uh, other kinds of, of maintenance, fuel, so there's a, there's a whole variety of costs uh, that, are, that are included in, in our budgets every year. When we look at how those costs may change going forward, um, they'll, they'll increase with the size of the system. And so if we're at 135 now, we, we think that once we're electrified, our, our annual operating costs may be closer to 190 million. By the time we're, we're running a fully electrified, fully blended system with high-speed rail, we'll maybe closer to 250 million. And then we think in the baseline, we'd be topping out around 260 million a year in, in typical operating costs. Uh, that's really, those costs are driven primarily by increases in service. Um, and that means more vehicles, more crew, um, there will be a, a ramp up in administrative staff that's needed as we grow the size of the system and, and take on the integration of some of these big regional projects I've talked about. There also um, are, uh, again, new assets being brought on board as the system grows or gets bigger as we run more service, there's more to maintain. When we look at projections for the different growth scenarios, uh, we're showing that in, in 2040, our annual operating costs would be anywhere between 260 million a year in the baseline, up to 413 million uh, a year in the high growth. These are all in, in 2018 dollars, so these are in today's dollars. Again, we are talking about much bigger systems uh, and, and the costs increase along with those. Crew cost continues to be the major driver of the overall cost, but there's there's really a, a spectrum. If we look at the sort of the present value of those costs, so we look uh, at, uh, out to the far future and kind of sum up the operating costs uh, over over the entire spectrum that we're looking at in the plan. We're we're talking about present value of operating costs between five billion and a little over six billion. We also looked at revenues as part of our financial projections, and we, we haven't taken a deep dive on revenues at, at this stage in the plan. Really what you're, you're seeing is, is revenue projections that are largely based on ridership growth and an assumption that fares stay constant but do grow with inflation over time. So fares are staying constant in real dollars and growing with ridership. Um, and similarly here, you can see the, the net present value of, of revenues ranging between 4.6 billion up to 5.3 billion. We've, we've shown a little bit of parking revenue in there as well as track access income. That's uh, uh, revenue that we'd be paid, particularly once high-speed rail starts running on the system and it's just based on a, a pretty vanilla assumption that they would uh, pay us on a per train or, or rather per mile basis for uh, a number of different factors where they'd be sharing the infrastructure. When we compare projected revenues to projected costs, um, we're, we're looking at average fare box recovery ratios anywhere between uh, the mid-70s and low 80%. Uh, that's a higher fare box recovery than what Caltrain does today, but not a lot higher. Um, we're around 70% today. Um, and so we, we have a pretty good degree of confidence in these numbers. Um, Caltrain is a very efficient system today. We believe we'll be an efficient system in the future as well. And these projections bear that out. 
Um, they don't, they aren't wildly optimistic. They don't show us making money or, or anything like that. And, and the underlying assumptions that have gone into these projections are fairly uh, straightforward and conservative in the sense that they're very detailed, but we have assumed existing labor arrangements. We haven't assumed that we um, suddenly start to realize any wild new efficiencies or anything like that. One of the other areas we get into um, when we start doing the financial uh, analysis is something called cost allocation. And this really gets to that giant $20 billion number I showed at the beginning and uh, the, some of the challenges of, of doing financial planning on a shared corridor. So all of those projects are important to Caltrain, but they all, or many of them, benefit multiple beneficiaries. So they're not just Caltrain projects. The downtown extension, for example, will be used by Caltrain and high-speed rail. Uh, grade separation projects um, benefit the railroad, but they also benefit local traffic. Um, and so when we uh, start to really try to balance costs and benefits, um, or look at kind of direct revenues and costs to Caltrain and, and conduct an analysis, um, we need to sort of allocate some of those costs to Caldrain and allocate other ones away. Uh, and this slide describes at a high level the methodology for doing that. It's important to say that uh, this allocation methodology is, is really for analytical purposes. It's so that when we do things like a cost benefit analysis, we can feel that we're fairly weighing costs, Caltrain costs against Caltrain benefits. Uh, it certainly doesn't imply exactly who's going to pay for this infrastructure in the long term, um, particularly on the capital infrastructure side. A lot of these projects are funded through grant sources or outside sources, so it's not a it's not an uh, intent of kind of who's responsible to pay or who's going to deliver the project. It's really so that we can weigh costs and benefits fairly. So when we uh, look at a sort of an allocated financial analysis, um, again, we're looking at allocated capital and operating costs that are lower um, than, the, than the fully loaded costs. And when we scale back to uh, sort of the proportion that we think can fairly be assigned to Caltrain, we're looking at lower total costs. Um, and then, then we show those ways weighed against the incremental value of the, of the revenues uh, that we would anticipate receiving. And this kind of analysis helps give a sense of the real, the financial differences uh, between these different options. The next set of analysis we looked at is what we call the Caltrain economic case. And so this really analyzes the economic benefits of, of the different growth scenarios to Caltrain riders. Um, so folks who take Caltrain benefit from the service in a variety of ways. And what this analysis tries to do is um, enumerate some of those benefits and, and quantify them and then ultimately monetize them. I won't read through the next slide in detail, but it, it describes the, the Caltrain user benefits, describes the different benefits that we quantify and analyze. And these are um, generally consistent with practices that are used to do this kind of analysis around the world and, and that the federal government sometimes asks for these analyses as part of grant applications. And so these are fairly standard kinds of, of uh, benefits that we're calculating and then monetizing. Um, this analysis is done on a, an incremental basis to the baseline, um, and so that's why you're seeing them for the moderate and the high growth. Basically, the baseline is held as zero, and then we calculate the benefits uh, above the baseline, or in some cases, potentially the disbenefits uh, from the baseline for the moderate and the high growth. And, and so we look at things like existing transit user uh, travel time savings. So how many minutes uh, would riders save if, if uh, we improve the service? What about new uh, transit users? How many minutes would they save relative to congestion they might experience in their, their vehicle? Um, we look at avoided auto trips and, and vehicle miles traveled. Um, we also think about things like roads network safety improvements. So if we're taking cars off the road, how much safer is the road? How many accidents on average are we avoiding or, or deaths are we avoiding? Same with public health benefits. Caltrain has a very high proportion of people who access its system with active modes, either bicycling or um, uh, walking. And, and in aggregate over, over years and millions of passengers, those actually add up to some significant uh, monetizable benefits in an economic sense. And the following slide really shows the monetization of those benefits and, and um, 
weight against allocated costs or the incremental allocated costs. And that allows us to um, come up with a, a cost benefit ratio uh, uh, for these scenarios. Uh, this is a pretty narrow analysis in that we're only looking at, at really the u benefits that can be associated to, to Caltrain users. Um, so it's a very conservative analysis in that sense. Um, we do have a benefit cost ratio over one in, in both of these, which um, suggests that the, both of them make sense from an economic perspective. You're seeing greater benefits than you are costs. Uh, the moderate growth one is is higher um, in part because the costs and the, the high growth are, are significantly higher. And again, this uh, next slide just presents that same information in graphic form. Next, uh, we did what we called a regional analysis. And so this looks at a number of different ways that, that enhanced Caltrain service benefits sort of the, the larger public beyond just riders, really looking at, at the region. Uh, the first of these is, is freeway throughput. Um, so today, at, at, at our peak hour, Caltrain carries about four freeway lanes worth of people per hour. That's in, in the peak of the commute, if you were to take all of our riders and, and stick them in cars, you'd be adding about four freeways worth of people, or four freeway lanes worth of people um, to the region. Uh, in the baseline growth scenario, we'd be adding the equivalent of another four freeway lanes worth, and then in the moderate, another five and a half, and in the high, an eight and a half lanes worth of freeways, sorry, worth of, of freeway, excuse me, freeway lanes worth of people uh, would be added. Um, so uh, a real substantial increase, really in all the scenarios in terms of the regional throughput um, that, that Caltrain adds to the corridor. Um, another sort of regional transportation consideration in these scenarios um, that sort of is outside of, of Caltrain is the extent to which um, they're compatible or, or ready for larger regional rail integration. Um, and so this is a, a little bit of a tricky concept, but it's really thinking kind of further out into the future if there were to be a second Transbay tube with trains running through it or um, trains running across the, the Dumbarton Bridge and trying to share the Caltrain corridor, which of these scenarios would, would work well with that. Um, really, the high growth scenario is the one that directly provides the capacity uh, for, for that kind of a system in the, in the sense that it already builds the capacity in and it would be possible for, for trains to um, use that capacity um, coming from other systems. The, the baseline and the moderate growth um, would need additional enhancements to be ready for um, truly regionally integrated rail. Um, they're they're, they're, they've been developed in a way, way that could scale up that way at the time that those sorts of decisions were made, but they wouldn't be sort of off the shelf uh, ready to have trains in a line from other systems. We also looked at environmental benefits, so um, really the particularly the kinds of emission reductions that we'd be expecting between 2022 when we electrify uh, out to, to 2070, the, which is kind of the full life cycle span of uh, these different sort of service visions. Um, really, we're, we're seeing positive environmental benefits across all of the scenarios. Uh, those relate both to elimination of our, our diesel service and, and switching to um, electric trains, and then they also relate to uh, the diverted auto trips, so folks choosing to take the train rather than drive their car. Uh, the benefits scale up generally along with the ridership, um, particularly that's true with the greenhouse gas benefits that are highlighted in red. Um, so the high growth has the, the highest benefit in that area. Some of the other um, uh, particulate emissions are, are more consistent across the scenarios. Those are more driven by um, the, the reduction in diesel train service, less so than the, the amount of new uh, riders we're diverting from cars. Another significant regional benefit we looked at in, in quite a bit of detail is, is really the extent to which Caltrain adds value to land around the stations. Um, and so we, we did a pretty detailed analysis of this, and, and what I'm presenting here is just a summary. Um, but we looked uh, at, at the extent to which um, 
there are property premiums uh, or, or value premiums added to properties that are in the vicinity of Caltrain stations. And, and what we found through a, a fairly in-depth statistical analysis was that on average, um, just today, being near a, for residential properties, being near a, a Caltrain station can confer a, a value premium of anywhere between three and 7% for single family homes or two to 6% for condominiums. Um, for office, it's a little harder to get an exact lock lock uh, on the value added, but it, it seems to be as much as 20% of, of, of value that it is actually conferred by being near Caltrain service. So this is a pretty um, significant amount of value that, that Caltrain generates in the, in the region. When we look at projecting that out to uh, 2040, um, we again did a fairly involved analysis that sort of built these models and looked at how property values might change over time um, to really try to understand how much uh, potential real estate value is Caltrain creating through its service. And, and the answer appears to be a, a significant amount. Um, so in, uh, in the baseline scenario, we didn't exactly run this analysis for the moderate scenario. Um, it is working with a lot of variables, so we sort of did a high and a low with this one. But in the baseline scenario, when we account for the new train service as well as the existing train service um, in, in 2040, we think, or we estimate rather, that we're adding as much as $25 billion worth of value to, to real estate in the Caltrain corridor. When we look at the high growth scenario, it's as much as $37 billion worth. These are fairly conservative estimates, we believe. Um, they actually don't include San Francisco. Um, there are too many kind of confounding variables with, with property prices in San Francisco for us to reliably do this analysis. So this is just based on San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. Uh, it's also confined to certain types of property. So we looked at offices. We didn't look at general commercial because, again, we can't um, necessarily reliably uh, extrapolate those numbers. Uh, so this is a, a lot of value, um, and it, it is potentially, a, a, as we begin to kind of pivot towards the next part of the plan and think about options for funding infrastructure, um, uh, tools like value capture are, are a potential source uh, that, that Caltrain or, or our partners could look to in terms of how best to pay for, for some of this infrastructure. Finally, we also did uh, regional economic impact analysis, and so this is kind of just a broader economic impact analysis that really looks at how the overall economy benefits and grows when we make major investments or, or spend money on an annual basis operating the system. Uh, so this is, uh, looks at sort of the direct effects of, of initial spending. It looks at, um, again, uh, sort of the long-term effects of ongoing operating spending, and it it really sort of follows that money as it trickles out uh, into the larger economy and, and um, kind of is, is spent uh, in, in different industries that, that support the railroad. Not entirely surprisingly, when we, we spend uh, large amounts of money, and, and that is what we're talking about in these different scenarios, um, the total economic output uh, impact related to that is, is quite substantial. and so. Uh, we're showing total economic output um, uh, of anywhere between 32 billion in the baseline up to nearly 50 billion in the high growth. Um, that that translates into a lot of jobs created, um, and and so uh, similarly, we're looking at a total of anywhere between more than 40,000 job years created in the baseline to nearly 70,000 job years created in the high growth scenario. The last area of the business case we looked at relates to flexibility and uncertainty. Um, and so the, you know, we've done a lot of detailed analysis as part of this process and, and shown very detailed specific service plans. Um, but ultimately, we, we are talking about 2040, and, and there is a lot of uncertainty out there. And, and um, it manifests in different ways, and those are important for us to think about as we think about, again, picking a vision that um, can really guide Caltrain and, and help us think about how we make investments and improve the service, um, but wanting to make sure that we, we pick a vision that provides that guidance in a helpful way and doesn't send us down a path that may dramatically change. 
So one, one part of the uncertainty, um, and I, I touched on this earlier, is that we're a corridor that's so integrated with other regional projects. And the majority of those regional projects are, are uh, in the planning stages, even though in many cases they're very committed and a lot of planning work has been done. But they're still in the planning stages and they, they still potentially uh, lack the majority of their funding. And so um, we've, we've shown this slide just to kind of emphasize that uh, really in all of these projects, there's a lot of money that still needs to be found. Um, and there are probably timelines and details that will change. Um, and, and those will influence what happens to Caltrain. So that's, that's one major area of uncertainty is, is around these, these different regional and state projects that there, there are a lot of unknowns. Uh, another area of, of maybe less uncertainty and really flexibility is in the service plans themselves. There's um, what we've shown very detailed service plans. Um, there, there are many variations within them and we've sort of talked about and explored some of those in detail throughout the process, but um, really picking the exact service levels that'll need to be at particular stations is work that'll come later, both uh, to some degree in the business plan, but a lot of it beyond the business plan as we actually start to make these investments and, and roll service out. We'll need to continue to do detailed service planning. Um, that can include, the, again, the exact stopping patterns and, and service levels of particular stations. It could include uh, thinking about opportunities to either close some stations or, or add new ones. Um, there's a proposed Oakdale station in San Francisco that's been discussed. So one of the major areas uh, where sort of flexibility around service options and uncertainty around the future really come together is, is when we look closely at where we will need new four track segments in the corridor. Um, and we know that the high growth uh, scenario most directly accommodates large scale corridor sharing and expanded service. Um, but the, the details of, of where some of those overtakes will need to be in the high growth uh, scenario are, are also very dependent on that corridor sharing. So whether it's with high speed rail or a combination of high speed rail and, and potentially other regional rail systems, uh, the details of that service really do um, uh, to some extent, in combination with Caltrain service, drive the extent of the infrastructure. And to the extent that that service shows up differently, um, or, or maybe particularly in the case of integrated regional rail, if we don't exactly know what that service might look like right now, um, there, that means there's a lot of uncertainty around where those overtakes are. Um, and that creates some real challenges in terms of, of thinking about today when we have a lot of projects that aren't necessarily fully funded, or in the case of a lot of the regional rail projects, haven't necessarily even really been fully conceptualized. Um, there's there's some, some pretty significant uncertainty in terms of, of going out and actually trying to take the next step of, of designing those overtakes or um, starting to think about them as actual projects. Conversely, in the moderate growth scenario, the, the infrastructure we're talking about there is, is much more modest. It's, it's still significant, but it's, it's more confined to particular locations. And it's more discreetly used by one or another service. It's, it's a little bit easier for, for us at Caltrain to kind of squint and, and, and look at those different overtakes and understand that one of them may really enable, uh, say, time transfers between Caltrain services, and it's something that we can control and plan for versus one that's needed for uh, maybe statewide services or regional services and is a little bit out of our control. Um, so there's, there's uncertainty in both of them, but it's, it's a little bit more complicated in the high growth scenario. Whereas in the, in the moderate, it's a little bit easier for us to kind of look at the infrastructure and, and more cleanly define uh, which pieces are needed for what. In addition to looking at, at those types of uncertainties, we, we also did do um, some initial financial and economic sensitivity testing. Um, this is where we varied some key uh, financial inputs into our modeling, things like the, the discount rate, um, the, the way we're valuing people's time, as well as uh, sort of aggregate capital and, and operating costs. Uh, the, the, we, we varied these parameters in the model and the goal was really to understand as, as kind of those key variables shift to what extent are some of the financial and economic conclusions shifting. 
Um, so we tested the, the fare box recovery rate, and, and it does shift up and down, but generally stays within the 70% the range. Um, we also looked at uh, sort of the percent change and just the overall net public investment required for these scenarios. Um, those, those change as well. Um, so this is the percentage you're seeing there on that line is really the percentage change in those, and, and those are those are varying anywhere between uh, adding an additional 30% to the net investment required to lowering the investment required by as much as 20%. Um, and we looked at changes to the benefit cost ratio in the Caltrain economic analysis. And the moderate growth consistently stays over one. The high growth is really a little bit more on the margin and, and is more sensitive to um, changes in those financial inputs. Finally, we have a series of slides that just uh, summarize uh, the, all of the different factors we looked at. Um, and I won't talk through these in detail, but we, we have a summary for all of the service factors, um, a summary of some of the key indicators for the financial analysis and the economic uh, analysis, um, summary of the regional factors, and, and again, a summary of some of the just kind of the, the key things uh, that we're thinking about in terms of flexibility and uncertainty around all of this. And so that leads us to our staff recommendation. Um, there are uh, accompanying written materials to this presentation, and I think the link will, will be underneath this video. And so um, really what you're seeing in the next few slides just, just summarizes the um, actual language of, of a, a vision that we would ask the board to potentially adopt. Um, just to sort of verbalize what, what the recommendation is, as, as staff, what we've really recommended is, is kind of a two-part vision. The first is that Caltrain uh, affirmatively pursue a, a path of growth that corresponds to what we've been calling the, the moderate growth, so the middle path of growth. Um, that means uh, uh, affirming a vision that talks about a mix of express and local Caltrain services operated in an uh, evenly spaced bi-directional pattern. We're looking at minimum peak hour frequencies of, of eight trains per hour per direction uh, between the Salesforce Transit Center and as far south as uh, Tamian, another four trains per hour per direction down to Blossom Hill, and two trains per hour per direction in the peak all the way to Gilroy. Um, we'd be uh, looking at recommending a vision that has uh, greatly imp increased off-peak and weekend frequencies anywhere between two and six trains per hour, depending where on the corridor. Um, with the off-peak, we've left that a little bit more open um, since that can be ultimately based on, on the demand that the system realizes. Um, we're uh, certainly planning to meet our commitments to the California high-speed rail system, and, and this vision uh, accommodates uh, the train paths that we've uh, promised to deliver with them. Um, this is also uh, recommending a vision that can be uh, delivered incrementally, and so we're looking at um, not just a single project to, to achieve this service. It's, it's really a, a set of infrastructure uh, that can come online over time um, and, and that will require additional study and, and feasibility studies uh, uh, on a project-by-project -project basis. And, and we'll need to engage with our partners in the community as we look at those options and, and advance them. And I think we're confident that uh, this vision is flexible enough that, that we're leaving uh, real room to, to work through those processes on a project-by-project -project basis. Uh, we enumerate at a high level uh, the, the general kinds of infrastructure um, that are, are contemplated to achieve this vision. And then really the second part of the recommendation is that even though we're, we're sort of recommending that Caltrain directly pursue the middle option, uh, we're also recommending that we don't preclude the high growth option. Um, our analysis has shown that there's really clearly a lot of value to the region um, in, in that level of service. It doesn't quite pencil out as economically well for, for Caltrain riders when viewed narrowly as a Caltrain system, 
Um, it's also one that, that really is subject to a greater degree of uncertainty. I, I talked quite a bit about the, the overtakes and particularly in the high growth scenario, um, there just are a lot of uh, questions and that, that and, and study that further study that's needed before um, I think we would feel comfortable really advancing that specific vision um, directly. But, but we don't want to preclude it. And so um, what we're recommending is that, that Caltrain continue to work with its regional rail partners to um, plan for some of the, the key regional investments, both the, um, the ultimate uh, realization of high-speed rail in the Bay Area, as well as other potential major rail investments like a second Transbay crossing um, or greatly expanded uh, ASIN Capital Corridor services or a, a Dumbarton Rail service um, so that we continue to work on what that larger regional vision could look like. And that while we're doing that, we, we take certain actions uh, to in, ensure that we are precluding potentially realizing a, a higher growth uh, level of service in the future and that that it would include a particular focus around plan how we plan uh, terminal facilities and and making sure that we're thinking about what it would mean if there were more trains going to those facilities at some point uh, it means uh, thinking very carefully about what land we sell um, if we have uh, sort of property assets where we may need to someday add infrastructure that's something we have to be careful about um, and it, it also means uh, that we need to uh, be careful in terms of how we think about grade separations uh, in areas where there might be four tracks needed, as well as um, how we size any changes to our maintenance facilities if we're thinking about growing fleets at some point in the future. Um, so uh, really not directly moving forward with the high growth at this point, but also um, taking some some pretty meaningful steps to continue the conversation and, and make sure that we're not uh, precluding that option in the interim. So finally, uh, as part of Caltrain's long range service vision, we are recommending that it, it be a vision that's periodically reaffirmed by the board. And that doesn't mean that we're uh, recommending that it be kind of completely overhauled or changed, but but just that we um, check in periodically and, and reaffirm that the vision is still relevant um, going forward and is still providing the kind of guidance we need. And that's that would occur based uh, on, on time. So doing that kind of reaffirmation, not, not less than every five years. Um, and also if there is a sort of a material change to either one of our projects or a partner project that, that really does alter the vision in a material way. And so that, uh, again, that brings us just back to the description of what is the service vision we're recommending. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a real huge improvement from today. We're talking about fast and frequent all day service every day, um, service that's user friendly, that's show up and go, um, a baby service, a baby bullet service every 15 minutes, significantly increased off-peak and weekend service, uh, comprehensive local service providing coverage to every community in our system. Uh, we're talking about a service vision that would triple uh, our ridership relative to today, so have us serving nearly 180,000 people that would add more than five freeway lanes worth of regional capacity to the corridor. Um, it's, a, it's a much more regionally connected service. We'd be providing end-to-end -end service connecting Gilroy to downtown San Francisco in both directions all day. It would be a regular service uh, that's arriving and leaving stations at the, the same time every hour, every interval of the hour, making it uh, much easier to connect to our, our, our partner agencies and, and uh, buses and, and rail systems that the passengers might want to transfer to. Um, it's also a, a, a vision that really, by adding Caltrain service, really strives to maximize the benefits of local, regional, and state projects that are happening in the corridor. Um, so when we think about local investments uh, and, and projects to promote grade separation or these big terminal projects in Deardon and San Francisco or even sharing the corridor with high-speed rail, providing more Caltrain service and better Caltrain service makes those shared investments more valuable. And, and so again, a lot of the service vision is something that really helps knit all of these different projects together. 
Um, having this kind of a vision really helps establish Caltrain as a leader in, in, in implementing a regional rail network um, and, and providing a, a type of service and an infrastructure that can really scale up and, and grow with that network as, as the region uh, kind of coalesces around its own vision for rail. And, and I think the, the part of this we're most excited about, we've talked about some very big dollar figures and, and the year 2040 sounds a long way away, but um, this is a vision that can be implemented over time. And the first major set of improvement really is right around the corner. The electrified service we have in 2022 is the foundational step to achieving this vision. Uh, that'll be the first step. And from there on, there are a, point, a series of incremental steps um, that'll allow the railroad to continuously improve its service and continually uh, grow its rider base. So what comes next? Um, so really the, the next step in the process is, is uh, to, uh, for the board to consider uh, the recommendation uh, for the vision. And then ultimately it's to think about how we move uh, from a vision to a plan. So we um, really are just now laying out what the staff recommendation for the long range service vision could be. Um, and we'll be presenting that to our, our board in August. Uh, we will not be asking the board to take any sort of action at that time. Um, it will really just be uh, presenting information. And then from that board meeting, we'll be um, doing a, a tremendous amount of outreach over the next couple of months in a, in a whole variety of different public and stakeholder venues. Um, to, to gather input on, on the vision and, and take comments and thoughts um, so that we can uh, then go back to our board and, and tell them what we heard and, and any changes to the recommendation. If you're interested in attending any of these events, um, I would uh, recommend, uh, again, going to the, the project website, caltrain2040.org, and you can find the latest um, updates about where we'll be providing information um, and um, <clears throat> times and, and dates there. Um, and as Casey mentioned earlier in the presentation, starting August 1st, we will also have an online open house at that website, and that'll be another venue uh, to, to review this material in a somewhat different format and just provide comments directly online. Once we do have a, a long-range service vision that's been adopted by our board, that really provides Caltrain with the direction to then work backwards. Um, and so to, to take that big, uh, very high dollar value vision uh, that's, that's out in 2040, which seems like a long way away, and really start to break it down into the key steps uh, and, and key increments that, that allow Caltrain to improve service over time. And so that, that work is, is what we'll be focused on in the, um, the fall of 2019, really into early 2020. Um, in addition to that service analysis, we'll also be taking a close look at first and last mile, so how people get to and from our stations. Um, we'll do that in a bit more detail. And then we'll also really be looking at funding and revenues. We've, we've laid out some, some very costly projects here, and so part of the plan will be talking about the different ways um, that we could generate funding or, or revenue or, or find new funding to help pay for the vision that we're trying to implement. Um, we'll be doing that work again over the, the fall of 2019 and with a goal of completing a, a full business plan document for our board's consideration in early 2020. The final part of this presentation doesn't talk about service. It's, it's focused on the Caltrain organization itself. And this is a, another stream of work that we've been uh, undertaking in the business plan process. And it really is, is asking the question of, as our service grows and changes, and as we think about the kind of railroad that, that may, we might want to be, um, how does the organization potentially need to change as well? Um, this is work that was uh, done for Caltrain in partnership with Stanford University, um, and, and Stanford was, was very generous in providing technical resources and support for this project. Um, the, one of the consultants that Stanford brought on to, to help uh, was a gentleman named Howard Permit, 
Um, Howard Permit works for Permit Consulting, his own firm, and he was the former president of Metro North Railroad, one of the major commuter railroads in North America. And so this organizational assessment has really been compiled by Howard and, and reflects his observations based on his professional expertise as well as his um, uh, many hours of interviews with Caltrain staff, board members, and, and stakeholders. Um, there is also, and I'll, I'll touch on it in the, the course of this presentation, there is a, a detailed organizational assessment report um, that is posted to the website, and that, that is the best source uh, for folks who are interested in this material. Within this presentation, I'll really just summarize um, kind of some of the high points. And one of the, the high points or one of the key observations is, is that change is coming, and it's, it's coming fairly quickly to Caltrain. Um, we, we run a very efficient service today um, and, a, and a successful service. We've had a tremendous amount of growing ridership. Um, but we're about to change. We're, we're going to become an electrified system, and then when we look further out, there are um, all the different kinds of projects and investments and, and growth that, that I talked about in the service vision. Uh, the organizational assessment report really looks at, at three different organizational areas. One is service delivery, delivery, and this is really how Caltrain operates and delivers its service. There's a lot of focus here on um, how we specifically deliver the day-to-day -day service and the contracting mechanism we use. Uh, another area is internal organization. Um, so how Caltrain organizes itself, um, the kinds of focuses and resources uh, that we bring to bear on, on the task of running the railroad. And the last area is governance, so how Caltrain is overseen by a, a governing body and, and um, the different options for how that could evolve over time. Within each area, um, the report sort of asks and, and answers key questions. One is around timing and, and whether this is the right uh, moment to have a, a focused discussion about that area of organizational function. Um, there are recommendations and, and focus areas in each area, and then there's um, a, a discussion of implementation, so really what work needs to be done next or what decisions may still need to be made. The organizational assessment process um, had a number of steps, and, and these are discussed and reflected in the report. Um, an initial assessment and set of interviews, um, a, a fairly detailed def set of definitions around what it is that railroads do and, and how those functions are fulfilled at Caltrain. Uh, there's a significant comparison to um, other U.S. and international railroads. And then a really detailed analysis of different organizational options uh, followed by recommendations. Again, for, for those who are, are interested in this topic, um, the, the best place to, to really get the information is the, the report itself. Um, that will, it's quite extensive, um, and it uh, will be posted at caltrain2040.org. So before talking uh, about organizational change at Caltrain, it's important to uh, talk a little bit about how Caltrain is currently organized. Um, and so Caltrain is a joint powers authority. That's a, a form of, of public governance uh, in California, and it's made up of three member agencies, uh, the VTA in Santa Clara County, the City and County of San Francisco, and the San Mateo County Transit District. Those are the member agencies that, that form the joint powers agreement, which in turn creates the Peninsula Corridor Joint Powers Board, and that's the, the nine-member board of directors that actually governs Caltrain. In terms of the internal organization, the, the JPA also designates the San Mateo County Transit District as the managing agency of Caltrain. And so the day-to-day the, the -day management of the system is performed um, by the San Mateo County Transit District. Um, some of, of those employees are, are part of what we'd call a, a shared services arrangement where they're also um, sharing their time with other business lines within the district, the, the SamTrans bus system or the County Transportation Authority. And then some of them are, are wholly focused on rail, so they work for a rail division and, and, and work on Caltrain for 100% of their time. Um, collectively, they manage the JPB and, and the, the San Mateo County Transit District Managing Agency manage the system, service, and assets. And, and um, 
that service is delivered uh, by a private company, Transit America Services Incorporated or TASI, um, that is responsible for the direct operation of Caltrain and for the maintenance of the railroad's assets. And so that collectively constitutes the, the current Caltrain organization. The, the report goes into a good amount of detail around um, how roles and responsibilities at, at Caltrain are laid out. Um, they are complex. There are a lot of different things that railroads do, and, and um, the way those functions are performed are, are sometimes particularly complex at Caltrain, um, in part because we have a, we're managed in the context of a multimodal shared services agency. Uh, we deliver services through a third-party contract, and we also uh, traverse a complex geography where we go through and at times share functions with as many as 21 different local jurisdictions. The report contains a detailed comparison to other systems. Um, so these include pure U.S. railroads. I, again, this isn't; uh, these comparisons aren't necessarily saying that Caltrain should aspire to to be like any of these systems. That's really a focus um, on, uh, to some extent, how each of these systems has, has dealt with or addressed um, some of the the different um, challenges or, or issues that Caltrain is thinking about, whether those are um, internal organization or governance or the sharing of services. We also uh, did a looked at a comparison with a number of international railways. Um, these are less of a one-for-one -one comparison with Caltrain. They exist in, in different economic and regulatory environments, and so um, there are some things that aren't directly translatable to Caltrain's context. Um, but these are all very successful railroads, and they're they're, they're all very good at doing certain things, and so there's a lot that Caltrain can learn from looking at our international peers and, and thinking about how they monetize real estate assets or share corridors with multiple different types of, of systems or um, incentivize the private sector uh, to uh, deliver the service efficiently. Um, the report goes through a lot of lessons learned, and I, within the context of this presentation, won't try to summarize those lessons beyond what's on the slide. Um, I, again, would really refer folks who are interested uh, to the report. Uh, finally, uh, the organizational assessment analyzes the, the sort of the three key issues of, of service delivery, internal organization, and governance. Um, as they exist in the Caltrain context and makes some key recommendations. So on service delivery, uh, Caltrain's operating contract with TASI expires in 2022, um, and then there are uh, some options to extend or extend and restructure that contract. That's a fairly near-term choice um, that, that Caltrain faces and one that's very important to uh, both Caltrain's and its riders. There are a lot of different factors to consider there and, and several different options in terms of choices Caltrain could make. Um, it's not a, a single decision point. We'll uh, potentially be able to uh, think about changing our, our contract vehicle at different points in time in the future, but it is a, a significant near-term organizational decision that's coming up. Um, the report evaluates, again, a range of options for, for how we could approach that contractual issue and then makes some recommendations uh, around the approach uh, to, excuse me, um, uh, address the operating contract coming up and the key next steps that would be needed to move forward. On internal organization, um, uh, the report found that, that Caltrain is, by many measures, uh, the most efficient uh, large passenger railroad in the country. We're the seventh largest passenger railroad by, or commuter railroad by ridership. Um, by many metrics related to financial productivity or productivity per employee, um, we, we are the most efficient large railroad in the U.S. Um, that's a that's a great place to start, but it is also reflective of, of some challenges and, and some resourcing challenges at Caltrain. Um, we've we've been uh, living without a dedicated source of funding for a while, um, and that has constrained our ability to grow the organization. And as uh, we think about um, the kinds of change that are coming 
uh, resourcing is, is a significant issue. Um, the report examines sort of the shared services arrangement at Caltrain and, and thinks about as we grow as a railroad, what services could be effectively shared uh, with other business lines or organizations versus which ones need to be really railroad dedicated. Um, the, it also highlights uh, key functions or, or areas where there is likely to be significant new needs or changes as the railroad expands and matures um, and, and sort of frames some of the key questions that should be asked in more detailed analysis that may need to be undertaken. Uh, it also touches on the issue of, of skill and talent retention at Caltrain. Caltrain, like uh, many employers in the, in the Bay Area, High cost of living area is it can be a, a struggle to hire at times and to retain staff. And then again, the report makes a number of recommendations um, around sort of key steps and, and additional studies that would need to be done to improve the Caltrain organization um, and, and, and really get it to a, a state of readiness for an expanded mission going forward. Finally, the report looks at the issue of governance, so how um, decisions about Caltrain are made and, and who makes those decisions. Uh, the topic of governance is, is pretty broad, and so the report uh, really divides the discussion of governance into three sections. Um, Self-directed options, which refer to options that either the, the Caltrain board or the member agencies could kind of self-define in advance. Uh, we also talk about regional options or non-self-directed options. These are uh, governance forms related to the idea of a regional rail system. These aren't things that Caltrain could necessarily advance on its own, but we could um, think about them and, and work with others to advance those concepts. And then there are a number of, of what the report calls parallel considerations. That are, that are also discussed on. And these are kind of governance level issues uh, that Caltrain will need to address, uh, really kind of regardless of, of which specific form of governance uh, may be chosen in the future. These options are, are not necessarily mutually exclusive, and so there, there may be um, changes among all of them uh, that could be considered. So the, the first area is, is again, self-directed uh, governance options. And there, the report really runs through a, a series of variations ranging from keeping the current governance structure intact um, to looking at some uh, modifications of the current structure that could be accomplished within uh, the existing governance documents, so without changing those documents, so really procedural changes. Um, to then a series of options that would retain the joint powers authority um, but would really significantly reorganize the organization under it to really be a sort of a direct rail authority of reporting up to the joint powers authority. And then finally, the idea of a special district, so a different form of governance that would be kind of a, a wholly standalone Caltrain. The report also looks at, at, at non-self-directed options or regional options, and again, these are, are things as we talk about um, all of the regional projects I talked about or the idea of kind of expanded rail service coming across the bay or connecting to the Caltrain corridor, running across the Caltrain corridor. Um, these are, are, are uh, sort of the, the governance side of, of some of those conversations. Um, these range from, from really how things work today, where we have separate railroads conducting separate business, uh, to uh, sort of the idea that those railroads could increasingly coordinate more of their activities through joint bilateral agreements. Um, the idea that certain rail functions could be regionalized, so this could be something like fare integration or schedule integration where you would retain separate rail entities, but key functions might be brought up to a regional level, to uh, something like a regional umbrella rail authority. This would be similar to the, the model that's been pursued in the past in New York, um, where you have s individual subsidiary railroads with, say, individual labor agreements or, or um, their own autonomy, but they are sort of under an umbrella form of governance, to ultimately the idea of a fully consolidated regional rail authority where it's all one agency. 
finally, uh, the report examines a number of, of sort of parallel kind of big picture governance considerations that, that Caltrain will need to deal with regardless of, of the ultimate form of governance selected. These include uh, major capital project or mega project delivery, uh, which is a huge organizational issue, whether it's addressed by Caltrain directly or by some other form of governance. Um, the report does talk about the idea of a regional construction authority or a grade separation district. Integration with other railroads. Um, you know, some, some level of integration with other railroads could be accomplished through uh, a governance change, but they could also be accomplished through agreements with those railroads. Um, Caltrain will need to coordinate with high-speed rail in the future when we share the corridor with them. There are potentially other or rail interactions or engagements we'll need to coordinate, and so that's a, a major, um, really governance level consideration that'll that'll be um, uh, something the railroad contends with in the future. And then finally, the role of the private sector. Um, so whether through our contracting or through development at or around our stations, the extent to which uh, we involve the private sector and the, the business of the railroad, um, that we want to look at transferring risk to the private sector. Um, that's the, sort of a, a big governance uh, related through line that runs through uh, a lot of these conversations. Uh, the report makes some, some recommendations around really the process uh, to advance the conversation around governance. Um, it, it focuses in on, on kind of who's making the, the decisions and, and really, um, again, focusing on the, the joint powers agreement as kind of the key document that, that governs the governance of Caltrain and would uh, need to be revised if there were to be a change of governance. Um, and then also talks a little bit about uh, Caltrain's interest in engaging in regional conversations as well as um, kind of forming a perspective on these other issues uh, like uh, construction uh, delivery, uh, mega project delivery, or the idea of a construction authority and integration with other railroads. Uh, again, for folks who are, are interested in the topic of, of organization, I would, I would certainly refer uh, to the report, and you can read lots more about this information. That's the presentation for today. Uh, thanks for listening. I know we covered a lot of ground there, um, and, and please let us know your, your comments or questions, and we'll be happy to answer them.